Kendall Lee, Chaplain Corps, United States Navy, retired, will now offer the invocation. Please join me in prayer. Almighty God, creator of the universe, master of the seas, maker of the land. We pause to give you thanks today for the opportunity we have to gather in this place place that runs deep with Navy tradition and wide with inspiration. We give you thanks that we can, in this spot, hear the sound of freedom loud and clear, and at the same time, in the quiet, hear the whispers of the Acadians from the trees. Thank you for such gifts. We ask that you would help us today as we now pay tribute to these who have served so well. To John now, whose sunrise becomes a sunset. Help us as we acknowledge him and his family, and may they be blessed with a deep sense of satisfaction from a season of tremendous and great service and sacrifice. And in that fashion, Lord, we pray for Nancy, who dons a whole new level of leadership, who now sports a new set of shoulder blades. And we ask God that you would give her the wisdom, discernment, and endurance that it will take to run this part of her race. Comfort and strengthen her family as they run alongside her and give them the grace that it will take to fulfill this mission and your expectations for her. Thank you for bringing her to this day and to all the excitement and vigor that goes with it. And now as we watch on, we pray that as we look, that we too might be inspired with passion for our own set of calling, our own missions, our own endeavors, that we will take from us from this place as we watch this transition in leadership. And for all these things, we will remember to give you all the praise and all the glory. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Guests, please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my pleasure 
to introduce my boss, Vice Admiral John B. Bussin, the 15th Chief of Navy Reserve. What a day. I'm going to get into it later, but first I have a very important duty, which is to introduce our Chief of Naval Operations. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our presiding officer and our guest speaker, the 33rd Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Lisa Franchetti. A native of Pittsburgh, New York, Admiral Franchetti has notched a number of impressive firsts in her career, not the least of which is being the first female member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. But I'd like to remind audiences that she's also the first four-star admiral who started her career as a reserve officer. And she's also the first CNO to have commanded a Navy Reserve Center. In fact, over the course of her 39-year career, CNO Franchetti has commanded at all levels, from Navy Reserve Center Central Point, Oregon, to USS Ross, DDG-71, Desert Round Destroyer, uh, Destroyer Squadron 21, Naval Forces Korea, Carrier Strike Group 9, Carrier Strike Group 15, U.S. 6th Fleet, and Striking and Support Forces NATO. She became our 33rd Chief of Naval Operations in November of 2023. Separate from command tours, she's led the Navy and the Joint Force with an emphasis on strategy, international engagement, and interagency collaboration, serving as the Director of Strategy, Plans, and Policy, we call J5 on the Joint Staff, and most recently as the Vice Chief of Naval Operations. And as impressive as her resume is, and it is, those of you who know her and those of you who work for her would tell you that she's a woman of many superpowers, not the least of which are vision, communication, collaboration, and inspiring leadership. I met CNO when she was Commander Frank Eddy, and I was Lieutenant Commander Mustin. Yes, that was a few years ago. Uh, on board the nuclear aircraft carrier USS George Washington, patrolling the Arabian Gulf during Operation Enduring Freedom. In fact, I worked for her then, and then years later, during my strike group command, when she was the 6th Fleet Commander, and we were operating in the high north. During those engagements, I never wondered about her commander's intents, I never wondered what was expected of me, nor whether she was looking out for her people. Those were given back then, every bit as much as they are today for the entirety of the Navy. So let's be really clear. Being the CNO is like being the CEO of a Fortune 5 company. Her budget is larger than Amazon's, it's bigger than Apple's, and she's busy. That said, we've seen quite a bit of turnover over the last two months in the Pentagon, and CNO has graciously presided over a number of three-star retirements. I've been in a number of them myself. But in, most of those included my friends, Frankie Morley, Team Black, me, and we're not done. Del Crandall, I see you out there. Del's got uh, another two weeks with us. But she makes time to be there when she could easily delegate this role and her part in the ceremony. We all recognize the demands on her time, which are ceaseless and unrelenting. But that's the kind of generous and selfless leader that CNO is. It's also why I'm so proud to have served under her command, to have learned from her, and to have her with us today. I will treasure this memory because you're here, so you know. So thank you for honoring Nancy and her family, and my family and me with your presence today. I, I know it's also a big day for Isabel, her daughter. In fact, Sino you know, and her family are leaving straight from this ceremony to drop Isabel at Bowdoin College in Maine. So I promise that I would cut pages 29 to 48 from my remarks so she could get on the road at a decent hour. So we should probably get on with it. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our Navy's 33rd Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Lisa Franchetti. John, thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here with you today, and thank you very much for, for your very kind, kind words. I know uh, there are a lot of really important people here today, so thank you all for being here. Honorable Parker, Administrator Phillips, Emma Houston, Emma Fogo, Big Pong, Flag, General Officers, Active and Reserve Sailors, Civilians, Distinguished Guests, Friends of the Mustin family, of the LaCour family. It is truly an honor to be here with you today. I really do enjoy, and I think it's important to be at all of these ceremonies, because it really is a testament to the hard work and the many years of service that our sailors and our leaders do for us 24-7, 365 days out of the year. 
Before I get started, let me please say thank you very much to the Navy Band, the ceremonial honor guard, for always adding so much to our celebrations. Can we give them, please, a big round of applause? And let me say thank you very much to the Fighting Omars of VFC 12, who gave us that amazing flyover, the sound of freedom, right at the right time, right at the freedom time, from Naval Air Station Oceana for their amazing flyover. Another round of applause for them. Well, today, as John said, really is a great Navy day. And today we get to bear witness to a time-honored tradition where we transfer the authority and the responsibility of command, in this case, Chief of Navy Reserve, from one officer to the next. It is a significant event for this command, for our Navy, for the Joint Force, and especially for John Mustin, Nancy LaCour, and their family. And there is a lot to celebrate. Just this morning, right before the ceremony, I have the privilege of promoting Nancy LaCour. So let's all stop for a minute and recognize the Navy's newest three-star Vice Admiral. Vice Admiral. And of course, today we're also celebrating the lifelong service and career of another amazing leader, a committed warfighter, and a very dear friend. Vice Admiral John Mustard. And we're celebrating the sailors, past, present, and future of our Navy Reserve Force, who have done so much to protect our nation since it was established in March of 1915. John, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this great day, and thank you for all that you've done over your 34 years of service. Joining John today are his wife, Kim, Eldest daughter Morgan, where are you? Guys? There you are. My bearings on me. Two twins, uh, Henry and Sinclair. Your mom Lucy. Siblings Tom and Kay. Lifelong friends, mentors, and your entire Navy family, who is represented here by those today and those who are watching and uh, those who are here in spirit. I know that John agrees that while many of us in uniform often get recognized for our service and our sacrifice, it really is our families who make such a long and distinguished career possible. So before I dive in and talk about some of the incredible work that John and his team have accomplished, I want to take some time to recognize all that his family and his broader support network have done to support him throughout his career. I'll start with the family that he was born into that set him on the right path, teaching him the value of hard work, dedication, and believing in serving something greater than himself. And John, what a family you were born into. As we all know, John's family is deeply rooted in our Navy's history. It's the kind of family name that's been making a difference for so long that the Navy has named not only one ship, but two ships after them. And just to put that in perspective, the Mustin family has served in our Navy since the late 19th century with extended family serving our armed forces even before the start of our colonial experiment way back in 1740. John's great-grandfather, Captain Henry Crosby Mustin, is an 1896 graduate of the Naval Academy. He is often referred to as the father of naval aviation. He developed the catapult launch concept, was the first aviator to be launched from the deck of an underway warship, founded Naval Air Station Pensacola, and was the first head of Naval Air Forces and if that wasn't enough, John is the third consecutive Vice Admiral in the Mustin family. Grandfather, Vice Admiral Lloyd M. Mustin, was critical in developing the Navy's lead computing anti-aircraft gun site, fought in Guadalcanal, and later served as the Director of Operations for the Joint Chiefs of Staff during the Vietnam War. And then John's father, Vice Admiral Henry Hammer and Hank Mustin, served in Vietnam on board patrol boats and then led the development of the Tomahawk missile standard missile, Lance helicopters, and the Ticonderoga class cruiser. And of course, we later go on to serve as Commander U.S. Second Fleet and Commander NATO Strength Fleet Atlantic. John, your mom, Lucy, who's here with us today, is also a part of naval history, two-time ship sponsor of the Calpins, commissioned in 1989, and then the Mustang, commissioned in 2003. And in fact, I know, Lucy, that you even earned a call sign from the crew of the USS Mustang. They proudly named their largest caliber gun, the five-inch 
and to the Lucky Lucy in recognition of your service and your sacrifice to our nation. Thank you very much for your getting John on the right path. Of course, we can't forget the power of siblings, especially in this family. John siblings, Tom, Kay, and Lloyd, who couldn't be here today, have all helped shape him into the leader that he is today. John, I can truly say that the legacy of your amazing family has been well carried on throughout your long and distinguished career, and that we are all very grateful for over 100 years of mustard service to our Navy and to our nation. So that takes me to John's next family, the family that he created with Kim, providing the love, support, and encouragement that enabled John to really fully dedicate himself to serving our nation. And it was truly a team effort. I'd like to recognize you, Kim. Wife of 31 years, your commitment, your dedication, your service to our Navy, to our Navy families, and support to our local communities has been nothing short of remarkable. I know that you can do it all. Not only are you a senior managing director for a private wealth management firm who's empowered entrepreneurs and families from all backgrounds, you're a loving, supporting wife, mom of three, takes your kids to practice, finally John will be able to help with that enough, helps with homework, and volunteers at school. And you did all of that, really, at least for many years, without John. And I know he's been here in DC for the past four years, while you are all back there up in New York. It is very fitting that John would find such a compassionate, caring, driven, and devoted spouse like you at a house party in Coronado 32 years ago. John recalls that he spent the evening talking to you and that he left the party saying, and I quote, I just met the girl I'm gonna marry. Kim, through every single adventure and through every uncertainty, you have been a continuous source of strength for your family. Thank you. Can everybody please give me, uh, give Kim a big round of applause. And to the Mustin kids, Morgan, Henry, Sinclair, I know it is not easy being the kid of a reserve sailor, or really of any sailor. Your dad working in different cities, leaving on weekends, weeks, traveling and doing a lot of deployments, not to mention being down here for four years, but I do know that you are your parents' biggest inspiration. Thank you for your own service and your own sacrifice. Can we give them a big round of applause? And as we're talking about good news, we also know that Morgan just made the varsity soccer team at her school yesterday. And that takes me to John's third family, his Navy family, the great mentors, teammates, individuals who've inspired him, supported him, and been there for him all along the way. John knows, and he truly makes it known every day, that it's the strength of that team that brings us success, and it fuels our own winning mindset. So to all of John's three families here today, to all those friends, teammates, mentors, those here today, those that you represent, thank you for having such an outsized impact on John's life. Now on you, John. Before I talk too much about your time at CNR, I do want to highlight a few of your career accomplishments because they are truly remarkable and extensive. From the onset of your career, you have had a positive impact on the history of our Navy and our nation. In 1990, John went to his first ship, the USS Vincennes, cruiser based out of San Diego, where he earned his surface warfare officer pin. His CO and XO, Captains Tom McKinley and Captain Jay McKercher, are here with us today. Can you all stand for one quick second so we can recognize you if you made it? Or you may not have made it, because you know it is Oh, yes! Yeah. You know, our first tour is sometimes our most important tour, and I want to thank you for doing your part to mold the Ensign Mustin clay. For his department head tour, he was the ops officer on board the Donald Cook, where he was a plank owner, and got to bring the ship to life. And then after 11 years of active duty, John would join the Naval Reserve Force, knowing well that he wanted to continue to serve his nation while supporting his family and his career and other interests. 
In 2004, a few years after 9-11, John was mobilized with the Reserve Force and took command of Inshore Boat Unit 22, a small boat unit responsible for patrolling the coastal waters near Kuwait. I understand that we have some service members from IBU 22 here in the audience today. So can you all please stand so we can give you a big round of applause for IBU 22 and your service. And in 2018, John would become the first deputy commander and staff member 13 of the reestablished U.S. Second Fleet. And in 2019, John went on to make history by becoming the first reserve sailor recalled to active duty to command a strike group of any kind as commander of Expeditionary Strike Group 2. Vice Admiral Woody Lewis. Woody, are you here? Yo, hey Woody. All right, he's here with us today. He told me that John was the perfect fit for the job. He said, and I quote, John is a warfighter, doesn't let obstacles stop him, and that he brought vitality, spit and polish, and operational and tactical focus to his command. And while he did all of that, John would lead and balance an extremely successful civilian career as CEO and founder of Wasabi Rabbit, a marketing communications firm connecting clients to their desired market hot and fast. And then in 2020, John was tapped to be the 15th Chief of Navy Reserve. And what a great decision that was. You were selected because of your ability to lead from the front, build teams, focus on mission, and think, act, and operate differently to ensure our Navy's warfighting advantage. And that is exactly what you did. You came into the job, you set a North Star goal of 70% warfighting readiness for the Naval Reserve Force, oriented your team towards that North Star, and you achieved it. You knew that the Reserve Force is more important and more relevant than ever before, especially in this era of strategic competition. Like me, where I got my start, you believe the Navy Reserve is a critical part of America's warfighting Navy, and it is. John, I could not be more proud of all you've done these past four years. You have transformed this organization, focusing our Reserve Force on warfighting and warfighting readiness and preparing them to fight and win in war, anywhere, anytime. John, there's no doubt that you have been absolutely the right leader with the right experience at the right time throughout your career. I know that you will be missed as a leader, a warfighter, a teammate, and most especially, a friend. I have no doubt that you are turning over a better, more well-equipped, more prepared Navy Reserve to Nancy than you inherited. How about a big round of applause for John? All right, now on to you, Nancy. Nancy, I know you are ready to step right in and get to work as our Navy's 16th Chief of Navy Reserve. Your 34 years of Naval service have included some of the most challenging positions in our community. You bring the exact type of professional experience and energy needed to continue this transformation, growth, and evolution of the Navy Reserve. I've always said that our warfighters are our Navy's secret weapon, and I have every confidence that you will work tirelessly to unleash their full potential. Your most recent command as the 93rd Commandant of Navy District Washington illustrates this point. Navigating through complex and very difficult challenges, your leadership has proven instrumental to the operation of our shore activities right here in the district. And just this past spring, under your leadership, Navy District Washington closed on a decade-long quest for a land exchange to expand the footprint of the Washington Navy Yard, and you saved our Navy over $200 million. You broke down barriers, helped solve problems, and you worked hard at our region's recruitment and retention shortfalls. Your ability to embrace the red, address root causes, has made a marked difference across our Navy's local installations. Nancy, I also want to recognize and welcome the service of your family. Your husband, Pat, also a helo pilot of 29 years, and your kids, Casey, Mary, 
Lucy, Evelyn, Lillian, and then Patrick, who's not here with us today, but is hopefully in court watching, and then we're from his, uh, his birth in the Marine Corps, and of course your mom, Priscilla, your sister, Susan, and your brother, Frank Jr. And I know that your dad is here in spirit with us today. It's definitely not easy being a dual military couple, and together this family, and especially Nancy's mom, Priscilla, provided the encouragement, the support structure that enabled both you and Pat to serve in demanding operational tours of increasing responsibility all around the world, and sometimes at the same time. Again, one special member of Nancy's family and a large influence on her decision to serve is her dad, Frank Sr., a naval officer, a surface warfare officer. And again, Nancy, I know that you followed in his footsteps and he would be proud to see you taking on this amazing career milestone. It takes a village for the kids who thought their mom was gonna be in the Naval Reserve and like maybe be home, that didn't happen. Lots of deployments, Afghanistan, Djibouti, kind of NDW, that was a little bit of a deployment as well at times. It takes a village and the LaCour family is an amazing and exceptional village. I just wanna thank you for everything you've done and are gonna do to support your mom in the future. How about a big round of applause for the LaCour family? Nancy, you are, as John was, the right person at the right time to take the helm of our Navy Reserve. And I know that you are going to help us all deliver the warfighting Navy that our nation needs every single day. So congratulations. We all look forward to working with you. And I can't wait to see you carry on the Reserve mission and continue sharpening our warfighting edge. How about another big round of applause for Nancy? Right, as a wrap up today, let me just say one more time, bravo Zulu to John and Kim Mustin for a job and such an amazing career. Truly well done. You will both be missed. We all look forward to staying in touch and wish you fair winds and following seas on the next life of your journey. And we cannot wait to see where it takes you. And then again, congratulations to Nancy. Nancy, as you well know, the challenges we face are only accelerating, but I'm confident that you and your team are going to move out boldly with urgency and a strong sense of purpose to prepare our Navy Reserve to fight and win in every domain today and in the future. Again, it's an honor to be with all of you for our Navy, this ceremony today. I could not be more proud of our Navy team. I wish all of you and all of our Navy families and support networks out there all the best as we end up end up this summer season. For the kids out there that are heading back to school, wish you all the best and good luck. Let's have a safe rest of the summer. And I uh, look forward to seeing many of you back. And again, thank you very much for honoring the Mustins and the LaCours with your presence today. It really means a lot to our Navy team. Thank you very much. And John, I'm gonna invite you up here to the podium, but I'm gonna say with one more thing that you would always say, Ladies and gentlemen, please rise. Military members, attention to award. There we go. The President of the United States takes pleasure in presenting the Distinguished Service Medal to Vice Admiral John B. Mustin, United States Navy, for exceptionally meritorious service to the government of the United States in duties of great responsibility while serving as the Chief of Navy Reserve and Commander, Navy Reserve Force from August 2020 to August 2024. Vice Admiral Mustin demonstrated superb leadership of the Navy Reserve Force, providing masterful execution of Navy and joint priorities and the strategic vision of his force of 109,000 personnel. He transformed the Navy Reserve from a global war on terror response force into a lethal organization dedicated to providing the United States with maritime domain strategic depth in response to great power competition. Becoming the first Navy Reserve resource sponsor, Vice Admiral Mustin oversaw the transfer of $16.3 billion in total obligation authority, resulting in a degree of fort design, flexibility, and agility not previously seen in the programming and budgeting process for the Navy Reserve. Finally, with his Battle Orders 2032, 
Vice Admiral Musson created a 10-year vision of the future Navy Reserve Force that will provide competitive advantage for the Navy for years to come. Vice Admiral Musson's superior performance of duties highlighted the culmination of 34 years of honorable and dedicated service. By his superior leadership, wise judgment, and deep devotion to duty, Vice Admiral Musson reflected great credit upon himself and upheld the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. For the President, Carlos Del Toro, Secretary of the Navy. Please be seated. Admiral Franchetti will now present Vice Admiral Mustin's wife and children letters of appreciation. Certificate of Appreciation from the United States Navy to all who shall see these presents and greetings to Kim, Morgan, Henry, and Sinclair. By the authority vested in me, it is my pleasure to express a grateful appreciation of the United States Navy to you for enduring the frequent and long separation from your husband and father as he served his country. These months, indeed, that he spent away from you constitute clear and noble demonstration of his love for you and his family. You see, he left you in order to ensure that you inherited a safer world, a surer peace. To those who say a single man cannot make a difference, I say wrong. Your husband and father did. He made our Navy stronger and kept our nation safe. With his service to the Navy now complete, he will spend more time with both of you in the future. The United States Navy thanks you both for your enduring separations. Given this 23 day of August 2024, E.H. Black, Vice Admiral United States Navy. Ladies and gentlemen, I now present Vice Admiral John D. Mustin, Chief of Navy Reserve. Well, thanks, you know, that, uh, there were certainly some heartfelt remarks. I uh, certainly appreciate, again, you being here and, uh, and the kind intro there. So, so, you know, Secretaries, Admirals Fogo, Houston, Vice Admiral Lacour, that sure sounds great, doesn't it? <laughs> I know it does. Other flag and general officers, senior executive service leaders, classmates from the great, great class of 1990 from the Naval Academy, first wave friends, distinguished colleagues, former shipmates, high school classmates, staff, family, friends, and of course, the superstar sailors of our Navy Reserve Force. Thank you all for joining us today. So what a day. I mean, special thanks to Emma Lee, our chaplain, and my friend and next door neighbor, Admiral Greg Todd, who's, uh, who's the chief of chaplains, for working out today's perfect temperature and weather. You know, I spoke to Greg about this uh, a couple of days ago, and I mentioned he had a role in all this. But my ask was that he put in a word with the big man upstairs, but uh, what he told me was, hey, I just want to remind you, I'm in sales, not management. Um, but I am certainly crediting him with the glory that is today, and uh, anyway, what allowed us to have not only wonderful weather, but that great flyby with the FC-12, so how about those Super Hornets? I mean, that's pretty cool. The sight and sound of freedom. Well, all right, so what a great turnout. And just to think that Nancy and I carefully coordinated our calendars to guarantee a conflict with our aviation community that has a, a, their annual symposium going on right now, and another critically important warfighter uh, uh, commander's conference just to keep the numbers down. Um, anyway, good thing that worked out, but I would tell you, thanks for making that Fonz boil. I know that you're here. I know there's some places you'd rather be. I appreciate the trade off. Thank you. So, Luke McCollum, it's hard to believe that a few, few short years ago we executed our change command under the veil of COVID protocols. All of us wearing masks, socially distanced, uh, in what seems like a distant memory in many ways. And yet in others, it seems like only yesterday. So Nancy, during our turnover, Luke shared a impression of a bit of wisdom. And if I were a gambling man, I would bet it would be the, as true for you as it was for me. So his counsel, the days are long, but the years are short. And I'll tell you, four years, boy, how true. It went by in the blink of an eye. So as a first order of business, I want to recognize a few of the many, many contributors whose participation and effort made this ceremony such an awesome and memorable experience. 
you know, the honor guard, the color guard, the band, the side boys, the honors bosun, especially the masterful puppeteer who was working until 0600 this morning on the base access list and seating charts. Commander Asa Ken, where are you, Asa? See you back there, program. And I don't think he is still up there, and he probably can't see us, but, uh, but Manto, while we were coordinating the flyby, was sitting on the top of that building with a radio coordinated and tied in, but, uh, but between all of them and so many others who went above and beyond the call of duty to make this day so very special, please join me in a round of applause to acknowledge all of these efforts. Thanks, everyone. So I'm going to jump right into acknowledging my family now, because uh, before I get into the meat of my remarks, and that is both because I think each of us in uniform deserve, recognize that they deserve first position, but it's also because I know that there's an over-under on my getting emotional up here. <laughs> and it's only going to grow with time. And I, I know on my staff, a bunch of you have stopped watching now, so, um, so I'm going to get busy here. Uh, I know the pool bounty on the timing is substantial, so I'm going to do the hard part first. <laughs> hey, Mom! Okay, so the... The, grand, the granddaughter-in-law, daughter-in-law, sister-in-law, mother and grandmother of naval officers. This is my mom's third Vice Admiral Mustin retirement ceremony. Uh, I think she's getting to the point now where she earns some kind of frequent flyer points and stuff for this. Uh, and in fact, the call sign that we use for her is Steel Magnolia. And I would say that she is the definition of a lady and family matriarch. So thanks, Mom, for being a great role model to your friends, for Navy wives around the world for your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandchildren, many of whom are here today. And in fact, it wasn't that long ago, I remember my mom saying, I am too young to have a baby who's a commander. <laughs> but I would just tell you that masks the fact that she is a fierce competitor on the tennis court and on the links. And many in this audience know that there are no gimmies when playing golf with a mom. All right, so seriously, thanks, mom. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'll tell you when it's time for that. So, yes, I am the baby of the family, I mentioned that. And as the baby, I'm glad that, uh, that two of my three siblings are here. So Brother Tom and Sister Kay, thanks for joining us. Um, and I'm gonna let everybody in on a little family secret, but you have to promise me that you're not gonna post this on Facebook. So for Tom and Kay in particular, I, I was shocked this morning that uh, Mom told me I was her favorite. Uh, kind of caught me by surprise, but, uh, but there you have it. Uh, you know, right, Mom? So, uh, all right, uh, to Kim, so our family's North Star. So falling in love with you was the easiest and best decision of my life. We just celebrate our 31st anniversary. And I've always known that I was punching up my weight class by convincing you to spend your life with me. And yes, it took some convincing. Um, but I'm glad that you're ready to listen to my sales pitch as a, a brazen, overconfident 25-year-old. And I would say, see, Greg Todd, appears we're both in sales to some degree here. Um, and special thanks to the snake eaters in the crowd, Will Randall and Brian Talley. Thank you for throwing the post-Westpac party uh, in Coronado, but mostly for inviting Ken. You know, I knew that night that she was the one, and Ted LeClaire had to listen as I got home explaining how awesome Ken was. So, anyway. I tell you what, when Admiral Gilday called me in January of 2020 to tell me that he'd like to nominate me for this job, of course my response was, hey, I'd like to talk to Kim about it before responding, though I really did want to do the job. So I called Kim and what I said to her was, you won't believe the phone call I just had. The CNO called me and wants to know if I want to be the Chief of the Navy Reserve. And I knew it would be a challenge given Kim's high octane employment in New York City, you know, our kids' schools and uh, sports entanglements, frankly, our lives and commitments up in New York. But she responded with a sigh and said, Well, I know you want to do it. We'll figure it out. And so we're all clear. I responded to Admiral Gilday, Yes, Kim says I can do it. Um, so. So thanks, honey, and thanks to Mabel Martin, who's seated in the front row. We refer to her as the fifth beetle and the special sauce in the Mustin household. We could not have made this work without you, Mabel. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been an awesome ride, the last four years and the 30 that preceded them. In fact, in a reflective moment I mentioned to Kim the other day, honey, did you ever think in your wildest dreams that we would be here doing this? And her answer was, 
Honey, let's get real for a second. You're not even in my wildest dreams. Um, but, so, all right. All right, I have to give credit to my friend Randy Christ for that one. Um, well, now for our kids. So there's a big difference between a 10-year-old with braces and two 8-year-olds, which is what I saw behind their masks during the Assumption of Command four years ago, and the young adults that I see in the front row now, who for the record are 14, 12, and 12. So thank you for your patience. And thanks for your four years of explaining why your father wasn't around during the week. But I can just tell you that it's all about to change. Brace yourself. Okay. So now, as Gene Black said, launch the alert flowers that I will keep talking about. Okay. So Mom, Kim, Morgan, and Sinclair, these flowers are a token of my appreciation and affection for making this tour work on the home front. And the girls are being presented a custom necklace that we made that I hope reminds them of this day forever. And I'll just tell you that it certainly will remind me of this day. Henry, no necklace for you, partner. Most Sundays when I would leave, I would say, okay, big guy, I'm heading to DC. I need you to help mom this week and step up to be the man of the house while I'm gone. You got this? And he would always say, Lately, with some eye rolling that I know many of the, of the parents in the audience who have preteens are familiar with, you go, yes, dad, I got it. And he did, but I'm happy to report, Henry, that you are being presented an official framed acknowledgement of your four-year successful tenure as man of the house, <laughs> coupled with the good news that you are hereby relieved of all duties of the world. I have to watch again. Nice work, partner. Okay, made it through the family. All right, to my aide, Eric Wynn, Amy Thomas, and Lazaro Cardenas, I may never know the full extent of your daily activities, only that I appreciated them. Often a thankless job as a junior officer having to handle and travel with the old guy, the boss, you know, it's hard. But I always refer to them as the most influential lieutenant commanders in the Navy Reserve. So thank you all for handling the myriad details of the job and making the experience easy. And I know it was no small feat, and so I have something special for each of you when we're done here. Amy, how about that time at Naval Air Station Whiting when I jumped into the wrong car? You should have seen the look on the surprised woman's face when all decked out like I am today. Right after wrapping up a speaking engagement, I walked out of the building, briskly into the car, parked in front of the building, opened the door, sat down in the front seat and said, okay, where are we off to now? And her answer was, um, I don't know, where do you want to go? Um, <laughs> Amy, a few steps behind me in trail, was horrified, as you can imagine, but, uh, but we sorted it out. So speaking of Amy, in three and a half decades, I've been fortunate to work for and with many remarkable female leaders in senior, consequential positions. Two of whom are on this stage, one of whom, who was the first female chief of the Navy Reserve, thanks for being here, Robin Brown. But others who are here, like Rear Admiral Kimberly Walls, uh, Admiral Eileen Laubacher, Commander Amy Thomas, Command Master Chief Nikki Rios, and Senior Chief Select Rihanna Israelson and Anasia Hines, they inspire me every day. Forgive me for missing a few, but I would just remember also that not all leaders wear uniforms, so other remarkable, impactful female leaders include my wife and partner Kim, my sister Kay, my mother Lucy, my uh, niece Sarah Mustin, and countless others in the audience. All female leaders making a positive impact every single day. So thank you all, ladies. So just a little over 38 years ago, my folks drove me to the United States Naval Academy for Indoctrination Day, what we call I-Day, and the start of our plebe summer. So shout out now to the class of 90, where I am. I know we got a few here. And those who trained us, like the class of 87, Jim Matheson, I know you're around, he was my company commander when I was a plebe. And Kim, Jim is the one who taught me how to fold my t-shirts in that way that annoys you so much. Um, <laughs> and that I still do to this day. But listen, I'm really proud of my Naval Academy classmates and friends, particularly my classmates who are still serving in consequential Navy roles. For instance, maybe you know, don't know this, but our three-star admiral is commanding the third fleet, the seventh fleet, the fourth fleet, Naval Service Forces, and Naval Information Forces, among other things. It's a powerhouse class, and we have many other flag and general officers doing the Lord's work around the globe. And even more, like Jim Delaney and George Dennis, 
who are serving as titans of industry long after they've hung up their uniforms. And I know this audience includes a few West Pointers too. My second favorite school, except for the second Saturday in December when you're dead to me. But in fact, if you'll take a moment and look at your program, you will notice so aesthetic around the outside. So, I would say worldly folks may recognize that this is Morse code, but the really savvy players will recognize that it reads, go make and beat Army. <laughs> and I know, I know, I know, Kim, Kim is convinced that I've got a problem. Uh, but Sean Oles, I know you probably caught it right away, Barton, you saw that, didn't you? But that rivalry, like so much of our Navy heritage, really shapes the experience of being in the service. You know, we in the Naval Service love to celebrate the connective tissue that binds us to our past. And in my case, as you already heard, I grew up in a Navy family. And growing up in a family steeped in Naval Service is certainly different than what would be the case if my ancestors all worked in Goldman Sachs. For instance, I lived just around the corner on this base in Quarters H, the same quarters that I lived in when I was a midshipman, when my parents were the residents there. These brass buttons that I'm wearing were my great-grandfather's. He was the class of 1896. My sword was my grandfather's, class of 1932. And my shoulder boards and my surface warfare device were worn by my father, who was class of 1955. Regardless of where I am, they're always with me. Another interesting connection, you heard briefly about it, but in 2018, I had the good fortune to be assigned as Vice Admiral Woody Lewis's deputy commander at the newly reestablished Second Fleet. Uh, a command that my father had previously led back in 1984 when I was in high school. And I was staff member number 13, which meant that we were like a startup, but it was a fleet command. And that was a formative time for me, watching Woody Lewis lead that team, the personal, selfless, gracious example he demonstrated then and still builds upon. It's a life changing experience for me. So thanks for being here, Woody. I, I heard you, but there you go. Thanks. So I remember, like it was yesterday, receiving a phone call from then Chief of Navy Reserve Robin Braun in 2016, passing the life-changing news that I'd been selected as a Navy Admiral. And I was at my sister's house down in Suffolk eating dinner with, uh, with her and my parents. And the process generally is shrouded in secrecy because the selection list isn't public yet. So the rules are, you can't tell anyone except for your immediate family. And when I said to Admiral Braun, hey, I'm sitting here with my parents. Robin said, well, of course you can tell them. Um, which certainly made for a wonderful celebration. And my father passed away before I was promoted, but I was always very proud of the fact that he knew of my selection. Okay. So in Reserve Force, I could talk about the great accomplishments of our Reserve Force, and the team has been driving change for hours. But I'm not gonna do that because I've been doing that for four years. So today, I'm just gonna talk about gratitude. We are blessed with platinum talent at all ranks in our reserve force. Admirals Mike Steffen and Luke Frost, my deputies Pat Barrett, Scott Fuller, my ridiculously talented, motivated, and tireless Force Master Chiefs Chris Coates and Tracy Hunt, and the balance of our staffs have set the force on the right life slope for the future. And that future is bright. I want to thank the 100,000 strong Navy Reserve Force, the dedication of our citizen sailors, civilians, and their supportive families has been a gratifying source of daily inspiration. Commanding, representing, and advocating for the Navy Reserve has been the honor of a lifetime. And for the laymen in the audience, the Navy Reserve is the fifth largest Navy in the world. On any given day, the Navy Reserve provides 100,000 sailors, three dozen ship, group, wing, and squadron commanding officers, nearly 150 aircraft, two SEAL teams, three expeditionary medical facilities, 2,200 strategic sea lift officers, 450 civilians, and nearly half of the Navy's Expeditionary Combat Command and Intelligence Capability. 24-7, 365, your Navy Reserve is standing at the ready with over 15,000 sailors serving on active duty orders every single day. For more than a century, your Navy Reserve has reliably responded when and where needed to generate and contribute to our national security. So thanks for the great work, Shilmaze. When I had the privilege to assume command, When I had the privilege to assume command of this incredible team, we challenged ourselves with a deliberate, comprehensive, and urgent imperative to redesign the Reserve Force structurally, procedurally, and operationally. We did this to align with strategic priorities, calibrated for a competitive security environment. And we executed this transformation to address new threats 
and to create the options that strengthen national leverage and amplify the nation's warfighting options. We did this with a singular, unambiguous focus on generating warfighting readiness. And my unapologetic focus on warfighting readiness stems from my belief that the credible combat power of our Navy is fundamental to the success of our nation. Every bit as much as liberty, equality, citizenship, virtue, and tolerance are. Each the very threads that bind together our republic. We recognize that we no longer have the luxury of waking up hoping that tomorrow looks like yesterday. We need to improve and modernize the way we organize, man, train, equip, and mobilize. And that we needed to make hard decisions, to prioritize what matters, to shed legacy processes, legacy force structure, and legacy expectations with urgency to prepare for the future. We had to get out of the business of answering the question, what can we do? Because we can do a lot. Instead, we had to answer the question, what must we do? And those answers are different. We also have to get out of the business of seeing busyness as an emblem of prestige. Optimizing attention focused on daily distractions versus focusing on what matters. Accepting joyless bureaucratic urgency as the norm or even the goal for the day. And frankly, just getting the wrong things done. You know, John Wooden said, never mistake activity for achievement. And I couldn't agree more. So early in my tenure, I reached out to a mentor, Admiral Mike Mullen. I think many of you likely know him or you know of him. And I asked, hey, given my task to reimagine the reserve force and implement enduring systemic change across a massive organization, Admiral, can you offer me any insights? And his response was, John, I mentor so many three and four star admirals and retirees. None of them have ever said to me, gee, in retrospect, I wish I'd moved slower. If you know what you want to do and you know what you need to do, do it. So I chose to move out. Now, I've been fortunate to be selected for command six times, and that ranges from lieutenant commander to flag officer. It's funny that, you know, early in my career, my father, a seasoned naval officer, advised me, it's better to command a bathtub than to be an executive officer of a battleship. So in those leadership experiences, I've learned enough about myself to recognize that I gravitate towards ambitious changes and challenges and audacious goals, that, that I take pride in a pathological obsession with doing more, better, faster, smarter. It used to drive my staff crazy, but now they're converts, regularly. I want to believe them. Okay, as it relates to what we do in the reserve force, my view is starting gun is sounded. My challenge to the force was to think boldly and act with urgency, not with less oversight or accountability, but with a common focus on the high stakes game in which we as a nation are engaged. We would rapidly find, fund, and field the very best ideas. In fact, I once overheard my friend and a former commander of our uh, Reserve Forces Command, John Schomer, saying to his staff, CNR is not a patient man. And I took it as a compliment, not because I knew, you know, he wasn't saying that I was unreasonable. What he was sharing was my intolerance for the status quo. My intolerance for the bureaucratic approach to problem solving that led to solutions that took years, not months, or months, not weeks, or weeks, not days. And I knew that we could act faster if we thought differently about how we would attack our challenges, and differently about what we would accept as the art of the possible. And I've always found freedom, and frankly, reward in the art of aspirational ambition, and simply asking, what if? I've always been inspired by Robert Kennedy's quote, you know, some men see things as they are, and they ask why, but I dream of things that never were, and ask why not. So for our sailors, it's a powerful enabler to imagine, to have a vision, and to be relentless in not accepting the status quo. Now, I've had many years of formal education, but I've never learned anything as valuable as what I learned by walking the deck lights, by talking to sailors, by thinking and talking to them about how to fight and win wars, how to take care of people, how to build great teams, and how to leave whatever I had, wherever I was, better than the way I found it. But the top of the list, and the most important lesson, was to find and listen to the enlisted leaders, regardless of rank, who make things happen. Eight of them are assembled today as side boys, and those eight each educated, counseled, and shaped my experiences over the past several decades. So thanks, shipmates, for being here. So speaking of great teams, let's hear it one more time from my Shore Boat Unit 22 shipmates. Thanks for being here again. This is my first command 20 years ago, and one in which I made many mistakes. But it was one that was blessed with the most impressive collection of talent 
since the convening of the Second Continental Congress in Philadelphia in 1776. The ratio of flag officers and chief petty officers, uh, officers who sprung from our band of brothers and sisters is unprecedented. It was a special group in a special place and a special time. While deployed, I would periodically show up unannounced and just say, hey, I'm going to ride on a mission. I'm going to go out on one of our boats. Um, just wanted to see how the team was performing. You know? So one night, I'm on board. It's dark. And I'm eavesdropping on the internal communication circuit during a pitch black night off the coast of Kuwait. And I hear Karen Reyes and Eddie Douglas discussing the inshore boat unit sitcom. So they're scripting it in real time. You know, so my first thought was, hey, keep it professional on the net. But I thought, well, this is intriguing. Let me see where this goes. The fun part was them discussing who were going to play the key players. So Eddie lobbied, of course, for Brad Pitt, who's going to play him. Karen, I think, was all about like Jennifer Anderson. And so I listened, I kind of lurked on the net as I heard this, until they got to me. The question was, hey, uh, who should play this game? And I was like, I waited awkwardly. But I was proud when they settled on Steve McQueen. <laughs> I said, OK. Could have been far worse. That's good. Um, all right. Hey, to my shipmates in the Navy Reserve, we share a restless courage that runs deep in the soul of the Reserve Force. It drives us to believe that tomorrow can, and frankly, must be better than today. We serve in a noble cause and we work in an unforgiving business. The Navy's business, our business, is to fight and win our nation's wars in combat. Even through tough fiscal environments in the midst of difficult decisions, your mission remains fixed, determined, and inviolable. It is to win our nation's wars. And in armed conflict, there are no second place finishers. And I don't need to remind you that America expects and deserves winners, which is where you all come in. The sailors assembled here today and scattered throughout our force are doing great work. For over a century, century, you have defended, guarded, and protected the hallowed traditions of liberty and freedom, of right and justice. You are the torchbearers of our Navy's rich history and legacy. Everything else in your professional career is but corollary to this vital dedication. We enjoy no God-given right to victory. But we can believe, as John Adams wrote, we cannot guarantee success, but we can deserve it. As we look ahead, it will be our collective responsibility to remain perpetually aspirational, to build on our momentum and further assert our place as the world's premier reserve warfighters. We are a community of entrepreneurial leaders, and we know that the most exciting chapter is the next one. I look forward to what you're going to accomplish under Admiral Gore's leadership and vision, which will propel our force into the future. So many folks are asking, what comes next? What is the epilogue of my life? What is the next chapter of service? So I have all sorts of lofty ambitions, but my first order of business is to not set an alarm tonight. And I've been called a lot of things over the years. The ones that I can share with you publicly are mostly honorific titles like Commander, CO, Skipper, Chief, Admiral. But I'm looking forward to trading those for Kim's husband, Kid's chauffeur, coach, they all sound pretty good for the next few months. And maybe even add in there uh, Kim's trophy husband. Um, you know, I gaze optimistically towards a future where I can rekindle a love for and frankly double down on a long list of former hobbies. But that said, there's some things I'm going to miss. So what will I miss? I'm going to miss wearing the uniform. I'm going to miss representing our sailors, our Navy, and our nation. I'm going to miss sunrise on the bridge of a warship a thousand miles from the nearest land. I'm going to miss cigars on the missile deck at sunset or on a 34-foot CR patrol boat. I'm going to miss promoting, re-enlisting, and retiring sailors. I'm going to miss working with the world's finest Marines like great Americans like Dave Bell and Lonnie Anderson and Steve Lazuski. And some amazing Army officers like Lieutenant General Jody Gates. Thanks for being here. I'm going to miss being part of several exclusive clubs, like being an honorary chief petty officer. Thanks, McFarnonia, Force Hunt. I'm going to miss being an honorary frogman, so thanks, Navy Seals, Ed Warbach, and Chris Weir. And I'm going to miss being the Navy's bullfrog, an honor I ascended to after leaving Luke McCollum. And today, I officially passed to my dear friend, Rear Admiral Ted Lutler. Most of all, I'm going to miss leading the greatest sailors in the world's greatest navies. But there are a couple of things that I'm not going to miss. So what am I not going to miss? 3.30 wake-ups and 4 o'clock gym workouts. 
I'm going to miss six day, four city trips with four different uniforms where I wake up thinking, okay, what city am I in again? And who am I meeting with? I'm going to miss packing combat boots, white shoes, black shoes, three different covers for a three day trip. Or what I think Kim would call uh, packing for a typical weekend getaway. I'm going to miss being what we refer to as a geographic bachelor. I won't miss it. Being, being separated from one's family and their spouse. In my case, Getting home to New York City at 8 p.m. on a Friday night, only to spend 36 hours at home before returning to D.C. Sunday afternoon <laughs> for four years. I'm going to miss being a broken record with my friends Jimmy Pitts and Brad Skillman. Yes, even long after I am gone, we, the Reserve Force, will still need KC-130 Juliet's 32 by 30. Over to you, man. In the meantime, I've got to make it up to do. In addition to re-engaging with life outside the Navy, I owe Kim and the rest of my family a husband, a father, a brother, a son, an uncle. So for Morgan, if you're looking for a cheering, supportive parent uh, for sports and for life, I'm reporting for you. Mm. Henry Sinclair, if you're looking for a rec league soccer coach and a homework helper, I am reporting for you. For Kim, the list is long, and it's kind of like offering a blank check, but I'm just going to say, I'm reporting for duty. <laughs> Could be as a man of leisure, you might be around the house a little more than you're used to, but I would just tell you, parent-teacher conferences are included. I got that. For our Tribeca community, and frankly for all our New York peeps, where are you all? To our church and to our community, I am reporting for duty. For cutting my golf handicap in half by the end of November. T-Bone, Nels, Dice, ball game, big man, timber, Chris Oleas, yep, I am reporting for duty. Okay, thank you for your patience. In closing, serving our country has been the greatest honor of my life, and I take great comfort in knowing that we have much to be proud of, and frankly, yet, we still have much to do. Shipmates, with these parting words, I pass the baton to Admiral LaCour and to each of you. Nancy, you're the right person, at the right time, in the right place. And the long blue line has never failed us. And your sailors are poised to bring your vision to life. So finally, thank you all, our Navy team, the great families, and the many friends and supporters here who've come to help us celebrate. I offer my sincere thanks for all you do in the fleet, for what you do at home, and for your continued support for our Navy sailors. At this point, I will leave it to you all to get busy and say, less talk, more action. And now, I take my leave. God bless you, God bless our Navy, and may God continue to bless the United States of America. Thank you. We're going to be here all day if you all want to sit down. <laughs> but thank you. Okay, I will now read my orders. Yes, please rise, military members, attention to orders. See no order number 1990, when directed by reporting senior, detached from Washington, D.C. as Chief of Navy Reserve, N095, Office of the Chief of Naval Operations. Upon completion and when directed, detached and proceed to home record in New York, New York, a city so great they had to name it twice. Sir, in addition to reading your orders, we have a special addendum which will now be read by three up and coming Navy fans. Come on, guys. Oh. Who authorized this? <laughs> Mom, text the group chat. I can't find it. Thank 
on track. Okay. <laughs> Bill D, haul down my flag. Aye, aye, sir. Haul down Vice Admiral Mustin's flag. <laughs> Vice Admiral Mustin will now be presented his personal flag by Force Master Chief Tracy Hunt. <laughs> Probably wondering how I got here so fast. It's magic. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Vice Admiral Nancy S. LaCour, United States Navy. CNO Order 0884, you are ordered to report for active duty no later than August 2024 as Chief of Navy Reserve, N095, Office of the Chief of Naval Operations. Billy D, break my flag. I am. Break Vice Admiral LaCour's flag. <laughs> Guests, please be seated. United States Navy, 16th Chief of Navy Reserve. All right, good morning. My turn. To the many, many distinguished guests here today, let me humbly offer 
all protocols acknowledged. And I'm going to start with gratitude to those who did the heavy lifting for today in support of this ceremony, the chief of Naval Reserve staff, Naval District Washington ceremonial lady Stewart. You are an absolute treasure. I know you do this again and again, and you do it so well. Uh, Naval Sport Activity Washington, United States Navy Ceremonial Guard, and the United States Navy Band. Thank you all for what you did today. I also want to thank those who traveled here today to be here, family, friends, and colleagues. I am truly touched that there are people here today from every part of my career, from Holy Cross to flight school to Djibouti and more. Thank you all. You humble me with your presence. It is my great honor to stand before you as a successor to a distinguished lineage of commanders, several of whom are with us today. Robin, your shoulder boards, thank you. And the most recent of whom, John, shares this, shares this stage. I'm also privileged to share the stage with Emma Franchetti, not only because she is our Chief of Naval Operations, but because she significantly shaped my growth as a flag officer. Emma Franchetti, Sixth Fleet Commander at the time, was my first boss when I was a baby one star. I was so fortunate to learn the ropes from her, gaining confidence quickly in my new role, despite not yet recognizing myself with stars on my shoulders. The event that stands out in my mind as a booster shot in my development was in late November 2018, less than two months after I promoted to flag. I was scheduled to speak at a Maritime Security Conference in Kyiv on Wednesday. On Monday, I woke to the news that Russia had captured three Ukrainian naval vessels and 24 crew members in the Kerch Strait. Scheduled to depart from the U.S. later that day, I called over to the Sixth Fleet to confirm my suspicion that this trip was probably off, only to be told to get on the plane as planned. There was some serious self-talking going on at that point. You can probably imagine what it sounded like in my head. Hours later, on a layover in the UK, I received an email saying that the Sixth Fleet commander would call me before I boarded my next flight. This was the trip cancellation I was expecting. Emma Franchetti called, and with reassurance in her voice, she told me to continue my journey. At that point, it wasn't clear if I would actually speak once I got there. We had to wait and see what statements came out of the White House and the Pentagon. But if I didn't conti continue the travel as planned, I wouldn't be there in time. Ultimately, I did speak at that conference, immediately following very emotional remarks by the U.S. Ambassador and the Commander of the Ukrainian Navy. CNO, your confidence in me in sending me into such a diplomatically charged environment was a fundamental milestone in my development, and it is a privilege to serve in the Navy you lead. John Mustin. How do you follow John Mustin? <laughs> Not just on the stage, but in the job. John, you are a legend descended from legends. Your family name is synonymous with dedication and excellence, representing generations of distinguished service. And to be clear, you're not just standing on the shoulder of giants, but you have carved out your own distinguished legacy. Thank you for the significant work that you have done over the past four years to set the Navy Reserve on the right course. While there may not be ships, streets, or oak clubs named before, there are some extremely important people by that name, and they are standing in front. You've been my greatest ally, a big supporter, and I'm grateful that because of your 29 years of service, you know what I'm talking about, acronyms and all. Thanks for providing encouragement when I need it, a sanity check when I need that, and rudder right direction when I call for it. And our six kids, most of them technically, technically adults now, give me a front row seat to the leaders of tomorrow. Let me tell you, they have demands. They demand inclusion, fair treatment, and flexibility. Casey, Mary, Patrick, Lucy, Evelyn, and Lillian, I am so proud of each of you, and I appreciate the daily reminder that while my Navy work is important, it doesn't compare to the privilege of launching six remarkable individuals to make their mark on the world. I consider it a coup to have five of the six here today. The only one missing is First Lieutenant Lepore. Patrick's currently deployed on USS Wasp, a ship I deployed on, and a ship Pat deployed on. Patrick, I hope you're watching. Keep your Marines safe. Change of command ceremonies are often described as a passing of the baton, and there couldn't be a more apt description of what is happening today. 
Compared to the marathon-like marathon terms of our competitors, where power can remain in the same hands for decades, we in the U.S. Navy are in a relay race. For us, it's not about the leader and their legacy. It's about leader after leader building upon each other's progress. As I take the baton today, I'm excited to bring a fresh perspective to our mission. At the same time, this transition does not signal a major change in course. Four years ago, John directed a significant and decisive turn, positioning us to be a strategic reserve we must be. With that full rudder shift in our wake, we'll continue to evaluate our path and make incremental, impactful adjustments until we're steady on our new course. John was singularly focused on warfighting, and warfighting will remain priority one. But you'll see a renewed emphasis on the warfighter in the coming months. The Reserve offers some unique platform-based capabilities, but what we really bring to the fight is our people. We put more players on the field. We'll focus on retaining those warfighters, ensuring that the Navy Reserve remains a force where each and every sailor finds fulfillment and a sense of pride in knowing they're part of something larger than themselves. People choose to serve in the Reserve for many reasons, but it's culture that influences their decision to stay. Retention is driven by culture. The better our culture, the more sailors will retain and why wouldn't we want to keep the sailors that we've already invested in? I can't drive culture alone. Each of us has a role in shaping and sustaining it. We can affect some change with policy, but the most impactful way to shape the sailor's experience is with, uh, with hands-on, sailor-focused leadership at the unit level. Our ability to accomplish our mission, to be prepared for the high-end fight we're called upon, rests on trust. We must continuously cultivate that trust with our sailors and families. They must trust in our leaders, our systems, and our resources. First, reserve leaders. You are the key to our success. My charge to you is this. Invest in every sailor individually. Find ways to make drilling easier. Be inventive with solutions and know when to offer exceptions. Respect the multitude of demands on a reserve sailor's life and remove unnecessary burdens. Ultimately, we have but one requirement. When the time comes, we must be ready to go. We can't burn our sailors out along the way. Next, trust in our systems. We must continue to invest in and advocate for the right technologies and systems to ensure that our sailors have what they need to succeed. These are key to ensuring that our sailors are ready on day one. Finally, trust in our resources. The reserve force today is markedly different from a decade ago, when we were mobilizing up to 12,000 sailors annually in support of the global war on terror. Now the number of sailors we mobilize each year is a fraction of that. The second order effect of this is we've lost some muscle memory. A large portion of our force doesn't know what it's like to mobilize, nor do their families. We need to strengthen and refine our sailor and family mobilization support structure. We have work to do, and that work starts now. When the call comes, we need the capability to activate 50,000 reservists within 30 days. We cannot afford to wait for that call to build trust. We have to build that trust now. John, I can't thank you enough for setting the course for the transformation, transformation of the Navy Reserve. Your leadership has left a generational impact. You can hang up your swobiator jacket knowing that you made a significant difference in the warfighting readiness of the Navy Reserve. My personal thanks to your family as well for all you have sacrificed, especially over the past four years. And in closing to the Reserve Force, I can think of no greater honor than the one CNO has given me in leading the Navy Reserve. Reserve life is not easy. Thank you for choosing to serve, to juggle competing demands of Naval Service civilian careers, and family. You are the reason why I am fired up about the next four years. We see storm clouds gathering, up, gathering on the horizon, and we can feel the winds of change. And while the approaching challenges may be daunting, I am energized to be in the cockpit navigating this challenge with this reserve force. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now read the watch. Host the watch.
For over 30 years, this sailor has stood to watch. While some of us were in our bunks at night, this sailor stood to watch. While some of us were in school, learning our trade, this shipmate stood to watch. Yes, even before some of us were born into this world, this shipmate stood to watch. In those years when the storm clouds of war were seen brewing on the horizon of history, this shipmate stood the watch. Many times he would cast an eye ashore and see his family standing there, needing his guidance and help, needing that hand to hold during those hard times, but he stood the watch. He stood the watch for 34 years. He stood the watch so that we, our families and our fellow countrymen could sleep soundly in safety each and every night, knowing that a sailor stood the watch. Today we're here to say, shipmate, the watch stands relieved. Relieved by those you have trained, guided, and led. Shipmate, uncle, you stand relieved. We have the watch. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the benediction and remain standing for the conclusion of the ceremony as Vice Admiral Mustin requests to go ashore for the final time. Chaplain Lee will now offer the benediction. Please join me in prayer again. Precious God, we give you thanks today, again, for that thing of gratitude, giving us overwatch during this ceremony. We give you thanks for the thousands across our country, across the globe, that have stood to watch in those places to make this a safe place. As we continue forward, recognize today that flags come and go. Help us to trust in your sustaining power to bless this nation as we go forward at our various levels of leadership, the diversity of the times that each of us have to make this one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We ask that your grace will always rise to meet us along those paths. Amen. Motion, post. The side boys. Following a time honored naval tradition, my Sapp Luston will now request permission from Matt Frank Hetty to go ashore for the final time. You know, request permission to go ashore. They know. <laughs> All right. Vice Admiral, United States Navy, retired, and family, departing. So you know, ma'am, this concludes the ceremony. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, 
This concludes our ceremony. You are cordially invited to the reception here at Lucy Park, where we will immediately observe the ceremonial cake cutting. Please allow Vice Admiral Mustin and Vice Admiral LaCour to make their way to the tent. Thank you very much. I am Commander John Cavanaugh, the ship's executive officer. On behalf of the crew of USS Kingsville, I'd like to express our sincere gratitude for joining us here today. Before our celebration begins, please silence your cell phones. Thank you. We are here to celebrate the commissioning of USS Kingsville, the first United States ship to bear the name Kingsville. In February 2019, then Secretary of the Navy, the Honorable Richard Spencer, announced the naming of USS Kingsville. He stated, the citizens of Kingsville have been steadfast partners of the Navy and Marine Corps team, and their enduring supporter of our future strike fighter pilots have helped make the city of Kingsville the gateway for future naval aviators. The ship and her crew are honored to bear the name USS Kingsville and are proud to honor the namesake community of Kingsville, Texas. Would all veterans and active duty service members please stand. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your service. Would all military families please rise and be recognized. Thank you for your support of our military members. Our ceremony today is a time-honored tradition which began with the commissioning of our first warship, the captured British schooner, the Margareta, in 1775. Since the capture of Margareta, thousands of ships have undergone the transition from Silent Hall to a fully alive U.S. Navy warship. My shipmates, our crew, who are here after known as plank owners, are in formation and ready. In just a few moments, Navy Band Southeast will render honors to the Honorable Vincente Gonzalez, Jr. Will the guests please rise and remain standing for the arri arrival of our official party honors, the presentation of colors, our national anthem, and the invocation. Ladies and gentlemen, our platform guests. Major Travis Ferguson, United States Air Force Reserve Chaplain, 940th Air Refueling Wing, our ceremony chaplain. Mr. Dick, Dick Messbarger, our long last presenter. Mrs. Susan Sugden and Mrs. Katie Lerwick, Matrons of Honor. Captain Matthew Lehman, United States Navy, Littoral Combat Ship Program Manager. Captain Randy Slap, United States Navy, Supervisor of Shipbuilding, Gulf Coast. Captain Douglas Mayher, United States Navy, Commander, Littoral Combat Ship Squadron 1. Ms. Michelle Kruger, President, Austell, USA. Rear Admiral Kevin Smith, United States Navy, Program Executive Officer, Unmanned and Small Combatants. Rear Admiral Theodore LeClaire, United States Navy, Deputy Commander, Naval Service Force, U.S. Pacific Fleet. The Honorable Sam Fugate, Mayor, City of Kingsville and Chairman, USS Kingsville Commissioning Committee. The Honorable Paulette Wajardo, Mayor, City of Corpus Christi, Texas. Vice Admiral Brad Skillman, Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Integration of Capabilities and Resources. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Russell Rumbaugh, Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Financial Management and Comptroller. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Michael Cloud, United States Representative, Texas 27th Congressional District. Ladies and gentlemen, our ship sponsor, Ms. Catherine Klein, escorted by Senior Chief Petty Officer Ramon Morin, Kingsville's Command Senior Chief. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Vincente Gonzalez, Jr., United States Representative, Texas 34th Congressional District, escorted today by Commander Ludwig Mann, the third Kingsville's commanding officer. Ladies and gentlemen, honors to the Honorable Vincente Gonzalez, Jr., platform and salute. Platform ready to. Advance the colors. Retire the colors. Platform ready to. We would like to thank the United States Navy Band Southeast and H.M. King High School JRTC Color Guard for the participation in our ceremony today. Ladies and gentlemen, Chaplain Ferguson will deliver the invocation. Let us pray. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain Ferguson. Will the guests please be seated? Kingsville, parade, rest. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Paulette Wajardo. Good morning. Mayor Wajardo will give the welcoming, welcoming remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Wajardo. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Michelle Kruger. Good morning. Remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kruger. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Sam Fugate. Good morning. Remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Fugate. Ladies and gentlemen, Vice Admiral Brad Skillman. Good morning. Remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Admiral Skillman. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Michael Cloud. Good morning, Representative Cloud will give his remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Cloud. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Vincente Gonzalez, Jr. Good morning, Representative Gonzalez will give his remarks. 
Thank you. Thank you, Representative Gonzalez. Ladies and gentlemen, our principal speaker, the Honorable Russell Rumbaugh. Good morning. Secretary Rumbaugh will give his remarks. Principal, principal speech. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Rumbaugh. Secretary Rumbaugh, I would be honored if you would place Kingsville in commission. It's my privilege, Captain. On behalf of the President of the United States and for the Secretary of the Navy, I hereby place United States Ship Kingsville in commission. May God bless and guide this warship and all who sail in her. Thank you, Secretary Rumbaugh. Executive Officer, hoist the colors and the commission pennant. Aye, sir. Ship's Company, attention. The commission pennant and professional national navies began to take form in late 17th century. All ships at that time were sailing ships, and it was often difficult to tell a naval ship from a merchant ship. Navies began to adopt long, narrow pennants to be flown by their ships at the mainmast, had to distinguish themselves from merchant ships. The commission pennant will fly continuously until the ship is decommissioned. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise. I direct your attention to the ship's mainmast as we hoist the colors and commission pennant. Quartermaster, hoist the colors and the commission pennant. Aye, sir. Captain, the colors and the commission pennant are flying proudly over USS Kingsville. Very well. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. I will now read my orders. From Commander Navy Personnel, Command to Commander Ludwig Band III, United States Navy. Subject, Buper's Order 0836 of 23 October 2023. When directed by reporting senior, detach from present duty and report to future USS Kingsville crew as prospective commanding officer. Upon commissioning of USS Kingsville, report for duty as commanding officer. Vice Admiral Skillman, United States ship Kingsville is in commission and I am in command. Very well, congratulations. Executive officer, set the watch. Aye, sir. Detail, forward, march. Put that pause in the right place. Good with that XO. Good pause. Yep. Yeah. Officer of the deck, set the first watch. Aye, aye, sir. The officer of the deck is the commanding officer's direct representative and while on watch is responsible for the safety and smooth operation of the ship. The long glass is the traditional symbol of an officer of the deck's authority and a ship of the line. We are honored to have Navy veteran Dick Messbarger with us today. He has served as Kingsville's Navy liaison for over 30 years. He will assist in setting the first watch by passing the long glass to our first officer of the deck, Chief Bosa Mates, Alicia Dela Cruz from Elk River, Minnesota. The Petty Officer of the Watch is Electronics Technician First Class Patrick Johnson from Buffalo, New York. The Messenger of the Watch is Culinary Specialist Third Class Rixie Bicio from Sacramento, California. And the Bosa Maid of the Watch is Bosa Maid Second Class Kevani Bailey from Queens, New York. Set the watch on deck section one. Sir, the watch is set. Very well. Detail, forward, march. Captain, the watch is set. Very well. The spirit of a U.S. Navy warship is the embodiment of her sponsor. We are delighted to have our sponsor, Ms. Catherine Klein, with us today. 
Ms. Klein christened the ship in Mobile, Alabama on April 22nd, 2023. And I would be honored if you would bring the or give the order to man our ship and bring her to life. Okay, good morning. Sponsor's going to give some brief remarks. Y'all look great on that last run aboard. Let's try and do that again. Followed by officers and crew of USS Kingsville. Man our ship and bring her to life.
Eight second blast on the on the whistle. Go ahead. Outstanding. Next time you do it, right after that last alarm. Copy, thank you, sister. Ladies and gentlemen, the crew of U.S. Kingsville salutes you. You. We are proud to serve in America's Navy. Kingsville, ready? Two. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Captain. That looked great, y'all. Yep, Captain, the ship is manned and ready. Very well. Commodore Mayhart. I can fuck that up every time. <laughs> United States Ships Kingsville is manned and ready and reports for duty. Very well, congratulations. Mayhart. Secretary Rumbaugh, I request permission to break your flag. Break my flag. Executive Officer, break the flag of the Secretary, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Aye, sir. Quartermaster, break the flag of the Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Aye, sir. I have that filament in the uh, command post, sister. The the. Um, if you'll come down after this rehearsal, I'll get it to you so you can. Bur Tie the flag up, okay? Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Captain, the flag of the Assistant Secretary, Secretary of the Navy is flying proudly over USS Kingsville. Very well. Ladies and, gen ladies and gentlemen, Commander Ludwig Mann III, the United States Navy Commanding Officer, USS Kingsville. Kingsville, parade, rest. Did they do it? Then I'll give my remarks. So when you're ready. Mm -hmm. Kingsville, attention. Will the guests please rise? Chaplain Ferguson will deliver the benediction. Let us pray. Thank you, Chaplain Ferguson. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated and remain seated for the departure of our official party. All right, the official party is going to go outside. Captain's going to go the escort. This concludes our ceremony. We'd like to express our gratitude to the Port of Corpus Christi and the Kingsville community. Thank you for your support of our ship, our crew, our Navy, and our nation. Ships tours will begin in approximately 20 minutes and run until 3.30 p.m. The line for ships tour will begin to your left at the aft ship's brow. Buses to parking will run until 4 p.m. We're going to change that to 2.30 short. Okay. Hey, crew, crew of Kingsville, give yourself a hand. That was outstanding. Good job. Y'all look amazing up there on, on, on the ship, man in the rail. We're gonna resume practice in about 45 minutes. So we have a good break here to figure some stuff out, where to stage those hats. 
uh, the cowboy hats at the quarter deck so you can pick them up when you do the run aboard. Good job, all the, everyone.